Hey, good morning, everybody. It's so good to see all of you who made your way out here. And all of you who are watching online, still thank you for joining us wherever you are joining us as well. It's just awesome to be in this house together, whether you're here or out there. Again, where we just come together, we have this ability to come together and celebrate Jesus, worship God together, be encouraged in our faith a little bit. I know I need that. Uh, probably more than once a week, but at least we get to do it once a week. Amen, everybody. I'm so glad to be encouraged with you in the Lord today. And I pray that God has met you and that he continues to do that with the rest of our time today. Uh, We're in a series, if you're new uh, here or you haven't joined us in a while, we're in a series called Seven Questions. And what we're doing is we're looking at some questions that Jesus asked us. And so if you do have your Bibles and notes, go ahead and get those out, grab your Bibles, go ahead and open them up so we can get ready and open to Matthew chapter 26, Matthew. 26. And so here's where we are in this journey that we've been in over the last six weeks. Uh, Here's what we've seen Jesus do. We saw Jesus turn a raging storm into a dead calm in a moment's notice, proving that he wasn't just a human being, that he was something more than that. We saw him affirm to Peter that he was God in the flesh, that he affirmed that he wasn't just human again. We saw him restore sight to a blind guy, a few blind guys. We saw him heal a paralyzed guy, that he was paralyzed for over 30 years. And then last week, we saw him kind of tell us why he came, that, that he came not to condemn the world through the law, but that he came to actually save the world through grace and truth. And with each one of these things that we saw, we saw Jesus pose a question to them and to us. And it's a question that we're finding out that actually points to who he is and why he came and what he came to do, okay? And so with all those questions, we're gonna look at another one today. And today, uh, we're gonna look uh, at a question and we're gonna find ourselves with this question in the last few days of Jesus's life here on earth, okay? Uh, Today is what starts uh, Holy Week. We're gonna be in Holy Week, which is a week that leads up to uh, Jesus being crucified and and celebrating his resurrection. Blair read the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Uh, And so we're gonna be uh, closer towards the last couple days of his life, but here's what we're gonna know or what I need you to know. His disciples at this moment, they have no idea what's gonna happen. They, They don't know that this is the last few days of his life. They don't know that yet. They're going to be completely blindsided by this, even though he told them over and over again, I'm going to die. The son of man is going to die, but they're going to be surprised by some of these events that are about to unfold. And we're going to be today put right in the middle of this. Okay. That's where we're going to be. And so where we are in the story, that's where we're in a series. And here we are in the story of Jesus is that Jesus and his disciples made their way to Jerusalem and they're right outside of the city. They're staying uh, in a place, it's a, it's a garden at a place called Gethsemane, okay? And so that's where they are. And this is where it's gonna take us. We're gonna be in Matthew 26. We're gonna start in verse 47. We're gonna read a little bit. Here's what it says. It says, while Jesus was still speaking, Judas, one of the 12, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now, the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one that I kiss is the man, arrest him. So going at once to Jesus, Judah said, greetings, rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus replied, do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus and arrested him. And with that, one of Jesus's companions reached for his sword, drew it out and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus told him. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? And here's the question we're gonna look at today. But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? All right, we're gonna stop here. We're gonna stop right at that question and we're gonna talk about what's happening. A lot going on here, okay? We're gonna wrap our minds around. This is a pretty crazy scene and it's probably a very familiar scene. Uh, If you are a church person or or, or you uh, have placed your faith in Jesus, a very familiar story, but let's try to put ourselves there as best we can. And so where we are is Jesus uh, had just got done praying actually. They had been there for a little while and he had just got done praying that, you know, they're outside of the city and this was a heavy prayer uh, that we read Jesus having with God because he knew that he was going to die. He knew that he was going to be crucified and what was going to happen. And here's what we also know. It's really late at night when he's doing this. And he actually asked a few of his guys to stay up and keep watch. But then it says that they keep falling asleep 
And I find, again, like when you read these stories, like the details are really, really interesting to me. And I think they describe more than what you think because right there, that held such a contrast between what Jesus knew was gonna happen and that these guys had no idea that these were the last moments they were gonna have with Jesus on this earth. They don't understand what's about to happen. And then Judas comes in. Judas is, he's one of the 12. He's one of the guys that's like closest to Jesus and he brings a crowd of people with him. But what we know is they're not friendly. So they're not people who are friendly to Jesus. They were part of the Jewish religious leaders who opposed Jesus and they they wanted to get rid uh, of Jesus. And we see Judas, one of the 12, betray Jesus. He gives him up. And when I read Jesus say, I don't know about you, when I read him say, do what you came to do, friend. My goodness, the tension of that moment it just, it goes right through me every time I read that where he says, do what you came for, friend. And so they arrest Jesus, chaos ensues. Uh, there's a crazy moment where uh, one of the disciples cuts a guy's ear off and, and, and Jesus just, he, he doesn't stop what's about to happen, man. And, and here's the thing. It's not going to stop because of the question that we saw Jesus ask. He looks at Peter, he looks at the guys who've been following for close to three years now, and he says, hey, how are the scriptures going to be fulfilled in any other way? So a couple of things here that that I think Jesus wants to clue us in on before we get into some other details of this story and the question, with the questions that he asks, because again, Jesus is about to be crucified. He's like hours away. He's not there yet, but he's hours away from this, and he's going to be crucified on a cross. But here's what Jesus is telling us with the question that he asked. The first thing that he wants us to understand is that this was not a surprise. Jesus did not die by accident. He wants to be really clear on that with the question that he asked. Some people believe, I think some people read about it. I've talked to people uh, in my life, they think that this was not, uh, this was something that took him by surprise. This was something that was unforeseen, it was unplanned, that he was a victim uh, of circumstances, but th- this is no accident. This was no accident at all. Jesus saw this from the very moment creation began. Like he didn't just see this when he was, he saw this from the very moment creation began. If, and if you read the gospels, you'll see Jesus clearly say it over and over again. I'm gonna die. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be put to death. I'm gonna kill it. He, he quoted Old Testament scripture to, to point them and, and point us to understand this was all planned by God. If you go to the other account of it in the, in the gospel of Luke, uh, you actually read a little bit more detail about what happens. And it says that Peter was the guy who cuts this soldier's ear off. And I find this interesting because then it says in there that, that Jesus actually touches this guy's head and he heals his ear. Like the ear, I don't know if it grows back on or if he like puts it back on and blows, I don't know what he does. But he heals the guy's ear. And, and again, I think he does this to tell them, hey man, I could touch this guy's ear and and it'll be healed. Like I could do anything. And if I wanted to do it in any other way, trust me, I can and I would have, but I can't do it any other way. I'm not going to do it any other way. So Jesus died not because he was forced to die. He, he, He knew what he was doing and he made that clear with the question. Here's the second thing that we need to understand that he wasn't just some martyr. Jesus wasn't... Jesus wasn't like a good dude who just died for a great cause. I think a lot of people think that he was, a, you know, they might not deny that he was around, but they think, well, he's just, a, you know, maybe he did believe in God, but he was a martyr. No, listen, man, he's not a martyr. He's not, he's not Martin Luther King. He's not Stephen from the book of Acts. He's a great man who died for, for a great cause, but Jesus didn't just die for a great cause. Listen to me, he died for a divine purpose. And that's different. He's not just a martyr. So these are really important to understand with the question that Jesus asked and led, that led him to be crucified that we're gonna see today. Because the why, the why is established, gang. The why is, is there, man. He died to save the world from the sin, that we deserve a death penalty for our sin and he came to die for us and to be the substitute for that sin. And it happened this way because of the, this the only way that will make us right with God. A sacrifice had to be made. He said, I'm willing to be that sacrifice to restore your relationship with your heavenly father. And so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna look at not the why, but kind of the what, so, so we're gonna take a look at this story and we're gonna look at some of the people who had a part uh, in Jesus going to the cross. And we're gonna see today that there is a big mix of stuff going on. There's a mix of, of different motives, emotions, political positioning, all kinds of stuff going on, religious positioning uh, that played a part. Uh, but we're gonna see that all this is already figured out by Jesus. Like he already knows all of this already. Uh, but because the people who actually thought they were in charge, they weren't in charge at all. 
They weren't in charge. That's what we're going to find out today. So let's back up in the story a little bit to find the first person, uh, the first player in this story. Uh, You could just back up to verse 14 if you're in Matthew 26. Actually, uh, if you do want to read about Holy Week, uh, the last week of Jesus' life starts in Matthew 21, if you want to read that. But we're going to pick up in the last day of Jesus' life. So we're going to be in Matthew 26, and here's what it says in verse 14 to find the first player. And it says this, Then one of the twelve whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, what will you give me if I deliver Jesus over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray him. So we already kind of read about Judas a little bit. We're gonna look into him a little bit more today. Again, Judas was one of the 12. He was in the inner circle of Jesus. uh, So he was known to be a companion of Jesus. Now, it doesn't say, we don't know when Jesus actually called Judas to become a follower of him or a disciple. We're not really sure how long Judas had been a disciple, but we do know a few other things about him. We do know his role. Uh, his role in, in the inner circle was he was actually the treasurer of the group. So he just kind of kept track of uh, the things they needed, the provisions they had, the money that they needed to buy certain things and get things. Uh, but it also tells us that he actually used that position for his own personal gain sometimes. And I find this interesting. I don't know, man. I find it, if you back up before that, the story that happens right before Judas goes to these guys is an incredible story. It's a story about this woman who comes up to Jesus and she breaks an entire bottle of perfume on him to anoint Jesus. Now, this is really a customary thing that happens, but you don't break an entire bottle of perfume. You almost take a little touch of it and just kind of wash somebody's feet. But we see this woman just break an entire bottle on it. And it says that one of the disciples becomes indignant about it and says, what a waste. Man, if she would have given us this, we could have sold it for a lot of money. Now, it doesn't tell us who said that, but I have kind of an inkling on who that could have been. It could have been Judas. I think it might've been him. Because then right after that, we see Judas go to these guys. And he goes, man, it's almost like that that was it for him. And he was like, all right, man, what's it take? And he asked for an offer to the priests, and then he did it. He took the money. And then he led a group of guys to the garden where Jesus was praying and where his friends were resting and sleeping. And then Judas went up to Jesus and gave him a customary kiss. So what was Judas's part? What was Judas's part? I think there are a lot of parts that, that were into play, but I think the one that sticks out to me the most for, for him was that he had greed, that greed was a part that played with Jesus going to the cross. I think about greed a lot in my own life. I think uh, greed is sometimes hard to put a finger on it for us, but I don't think it's because we don't have it in our lives. Here's why, gang. It just goes by other names. It goes by other names. It, it goes by the name credit card debt, right? It goes by the name of, of, of just kind of keeping up with, with everybody else. It goes by the name of having more than, than what I, we even need because I, I wanna make sure that we have everything. And it goes by living beyond our means. It, it's a fear of missing out. It goes by a lot of different names. You know, I wonder about Judas, I do. I wonder if, if he thought about or if he knew that that was what was gonna lead, that that arrest is what led to Jesus' death. We don't know, it doesn't really tell us, but what we do see is not too much after that that he, he hangs himself. He ends up committing suicide before Jesus dies on the cross. At some point, at some point, all of us will be tempted to trade in our relationship with God with something or someone else. We'll all be tempted to do that, but Judas shows us, and, and we learn in our own lives that the, that the second you do that, man, the value of that thing just begins to diminish immediately. So gang, listen to me, man. It wasn't just Judas's greed to put him on the cross. We all have it. It was our greed. It is our greed that put him on the cross. Let's go to the next person. Next person with, the, with what put him to the cross. Actually, a group of people. It's a group of people called the Pharisees. We know a little bit about them if you've come to church at all. Uh, so jump to Mark 14 if you wanna follow along in the story. We're gonna jump to another account in Mark 14. Uh, now, the Pharisees are, are sort of made up by a lot of different people. Uh, they are what they would say, they were the followers of, of Moses's 
uh, law of Moses as God. They were followers, they were teachers and followers of the law of Moses. And so they would be the ones, I don't know if they would all say, we, they get a bad rap, but they would say they follow God the most, that they are closest to God than anybody else and they're more spiritual than anybody else. And so these are the guys who Jesus has turned over to, all right? This group of Pharisees. And what they end up doing is they end up giving Jesus a trial. It's a religious group. And so it's not formal yet with the government of Rome, but they put him in a trial with a group called the Sanhedrin, which is the, the leaders are almost like the Supreme Court uh, of Israel. And so it's basically the chief priests and the Pharisees. So we're gonna take you to, to read a little bit more. We're gonna be in Mark 14 and we're gonna pick this up in verse 55. So it says this. It says, so inside the leading priests and the entire high council were trying to find evidence against Jesus. Evidence to put him to death. So they could, oh, so they could put him to death. But they couldn't find any way. Many false witnesses spoke against him, but they contradicted each other. Finally, some men stood up and gave this false testimony. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days I will build another made without human hands. But even then, they didn't get their story straight. Then the high priest stood up before the others and asked Jesus, Well, are you going to answer these charges? What do you have to say for yourself? But Jesus was silent and made no reply. So it tells us that these guys, he's, they're, they're accusing him. They're, you know, they're just bombarding him with all these false statements, false witnesses. They're asking him all these questions. If you read more in the, the other accounts, they're mocking him. They're making fun of him. They're ridiculing him. And in every account you read, he doesn't say a thing. He just sits there in silence, not even making an attempt to correct their lies, not even making an attempt to explain his mission correctly. He sits in silence while these dudes mock him. Nothing sticks though. They can't even get their story straight, it says, right? They had nothing on him and he remains silent. And then the tables turn in verse 61. It says, again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? And Jesus breaks the silence and he says, I am. And you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And it was that question that broke his silence. We don't know how long he was sitting there with this group, but I bet you it was a long time with him saying nothing. And then this is the one of all the questions. This is the one of all the false stories, all the ridicule that came. He doesn't budge. And then this question, are you the Christ? That's where we see the response from Jesus. I think uh, for, for those of us who, who go to church, those of us who are in church, I think when you see the word Christ, I think sometimes uh, we get so used to the term Christ that, that we, need to, we forget something about this. Like Christ is not Jesus's last name. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not like where you just kind of see in the story where it's like, hey, Joseph Christ, uh, this is my wife, Mary, and here's Jesus. Like, hey, Andy Tool, nice to meet you, Mr. Christ. Like, that's not... What it is, this is all it is. I think sometimes we forget that. Because here's the thing, gang. The word Christ uh, in the Greek word comes from this root uh, word called kreo, which means to anoint. And what this means is the anointed one, the only one, the, the Messiah. And so now we see how loaded this question is with this guy. He wasn't just asking about his last name. He wasn't just saying, is that your last name? He was saying, are you God's son? Are you the one we've been waiting for who God has anointed? I am. Whew. Now, what he used there was not just a responsive phrase of I am. What he used there was a Greek word that actually was a name of God. It was capital A-M, I am. That puts a little bit of a different spin on it, doesn't it? You know, I wonder if they were surprised by his omission there. Because they, now they got him. They're like, now he admitted, he didn't just say, I am. He's saying, I am God in the flesh, man. That's the one thing we needed. That's the one thing we needed, man. Surprise or not, man, they have him now. He equated himself with God. He made himself God. And, and that's blasphemy where they live. And so that's what they needed to take him to the Romans. And that's punishable by death. Why were these guys like so bent on getting Jesus caught up in this. Why did they want him to die? Like I understand if you don't agree with somebody, but why did they want him to die? Here's why. Because he was that much of a threat to their way, to their system, to their message. 
Because gang, here's the thing. His message was a little bit different from their message. And he taught from the same scriptures that they did. And it was coming from a completely different place. See, his message was a a message of love and forgiveness. Theirs was of rules and laws. His message was a message of grace and truth. That's what we talked about over the last six weeks with the questions that he asked. But they they didn't want anything to do with grace, man. Because like, we can't use that to make us look better than anybody else. We can't use that to show our superiority over people. Jesus, man, he challenged their power. He challenged their influence. He challenged their message about God. He taught from the same scriptures. He healed people right in front of them. And they still refused to believe that he was God in the flesh because of one thing, because of their pride. Their pride did not let them see what was right in front of their face. They saw him do these amazing things because pride creates blindness. It, 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 it makes you blind to seeing clearly what is right in front of you. It impairs our capacity to notice it. You could be prideful and not even know it. And all my years, you know, here's why I know this, because in all my years as a pastor, uh, man, I've, I've met with people over a lot of things. I mean, a lot of things. A lot of people come up to me and ask me for God's help in a lot of areas of their life. You know, it could be marriage problems. It could be like spiritual motivation problems. It could be, you know, anger, lust, all kinds of things. But I have never had anyone come up to me and say, Andy, can you help me with my pride problem? Uh, no one's ever done that. No one's ever, it just hides in different ways like that. It does, it, it, you know, we either don't think we have it or we don't think it's that big of a deal. I think that might be the bigger reason. Pride fogs your perspective. Truth is, here's the truth about us. You can't really do anything on your own, but pride refuses to believe it. That's basically pride in a nutshell for me. Like, well, I don't know why I keep thinking I need to do, can do stuff on my own, but God always points us to the, to the truth that we can't do. God gives us breath. God gives us life. God gives us today as long as it's called today. He's like, don't mistake the breath that you breathe. That's what we sing. Like, he is our breath of life. And, but like the religious leaders, we think we can go to church, read, pray, and we kind of earn God's favor. We earn that stuff. We, we kind of stay in that area of like, look at what I'm doing. It's all pride. So again, it wasn't just their pride. It's our pride. They <laughs> put Jesus on the cross. So after the Sanhedrin found him guilty, the next step is they, they threw him over to Rome, man. They took him to Ro- the Roman government and the Roman court. They wanted to kill Jesus, but they could, and they weren't allowed uh, to do that. We talked about that a few weeks ago. Uh, but so, so they were hoping that what they could do with the evidence they had was to convince these guys, yes, you should kill him, man. He's a threat and all that stuff. And, and so they turned him over uh, to Rome and, and hoping that they, that they would do that. Now, the funny thing about these guys uh, is that the, the Sanhedrin and, and the Pharisees and, and the Sadducees, all these guys they all were like they said they were followers of the God of Israel but they were all they never agreed on anything they're all like no this is how you follow God no this is how you follow no, 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 no. but they all agreed that Rome stinks like they, they at least they'd be like yeah but Rome stinks and they're like yeah like they, they hated Rome they didn't like Rome at all and, and the Roman leader in Jerusalem at that time was a guy named Pilate uh, so let's talk about him a little bit we meet him first in Luke 13 Uh, That's where you first see this guy, Pilate. And what we see here is that these guys come up to Jesus and and tell him this leader, Pilate, killed a bunch of people in the temple, like a bunch of them. And the temple was like a sacred place to be. uh, And that's where they found, that's where we find first uh, a little bit of information about Pilate. In fact, uh, it it goes on to say that, that Pilate killed so many people in Samaria, that's where he was at the time, that it caused like so much unrest that Caesar actually fires Pilate and brings him back to Rome, okay? Uh, There's an ancient writer named Philo or Philo. uh, This is what he said about Pilate's rule, that it was marked by bribery, insults, robberies, supreme cruelty, executions without a trial, and a furious, vindictive temper. Sounds like a keeper. You know, it's like, let's keep him there. Let's, get, let's just move him around a little bit. But uh, so Pilate, uh, he was in charge in Jerusalem. So he was the judge and jury uh, on uh, tell, saying whether Jesus were gonna die. But here's the other thing, man. He was also the one that could say, no, we're not gonna do it. He could, he could set Jesus free if he chose to. And so Pharisees go up to him and say, hey, we found this guy, man. He's guilty of a lot of things. Hey, he doesn't wanna pay taxes to Caesar. Hey, he says he's a king, man. Uh, he's challenging our nation. Uh, this Jesus, he's a problem. 
problem for him. Caesar would not like him at all. You should kill, you should really put him to death, man. Like he's a threat. And the funny thing is, these guys who were saying that Jesus didn't want to pay taxes, they didn't want to pay taxes either. Jesus was, was the one who told them to pay taxes. Uh, but anyways, they're just trying to pressure Pilate to make him do what they wanted to do. So we're gonna pick this up. Go one more chapter in Mark 15. We're gonna read a little bit about what happens. So they turn him over to Pilate. It says that they bound Jesus. Verse one, they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, by the way, I find this interesting that each one of these, we see a question in each one of these as well. I just, I just found that really neat. I didn't even mean for that to happen as we go through the seven questions. But anyways, and they bound Jesus and Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, you said so. And the chief priest accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer so that Pilate was amazed. And if you read uh, the chapters in, in the, or the, the chapters in Mark and the other gospels, you'll find that Pilate was like, I can't find anything that this guy's really guilty of. Like that's what he ends up saying. Uh, but what's happened is that the people and the Jewish leaders have become so frenzied now like they're so fired up, they're so sure that Jesus needs to die that he starts to get a fear that if he doesn't do it, then he won't appease them and then there's gonna be more unrest. And so here's the thing, if there's unrest in the region, what happens? Well, he already knows what happens, he'll get fired. And so he doesn't wanna get fired again. And so here's what happens. So he brings Jesus out to the crowd after he asks these questions. They are in a frenzy. They just wanna see something happen, man. Like they're just like, we want something interesting to happen. So they're yelling, crucify him, crucify him. And it says, as Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the same, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas and having scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And so with that right there, the, the sentence is set. Death is coming for Jesus. There are two reasons why Pilate did this. The first reason is that he felt like he needed to please the crowd. Like he needed to do that. Again, he knows what happens if he doesn't. So he kind of, there was pressure from the people. There was pressure from them. And so he folded to the pressure. And I mean, could you imagine? Can you imagine someone succumbing to peer pressure so easily? Yeah, yeah, we could imagine that, right? It happens all the time. It's so, I mean, you got that kind of going on. It's easy to go with the crowd. I worry about that with my kids. You know, as they get older, I worry about the peer pressure because a lot of times it happens when you're not there. I don't know about you, but I worry about that. But I have hope for my kids. The other day we were in the car and uh, we were talking about driving and how old you have to be and all that stuff. And, and so my eight-year-old asked, hey, how old do I have to be to be an adult? Courtney said 18, I said 35. But anyways... <laughs> And so we were talking and I said, well, why do you want to know how old you need to be an adult? And he said, well, I want to know when I can do adult stuff. And Courtney said, well, you know, like driving. He goes, yeah, like driving and drinking Red Bull and cussing. And he started, it was true. And he just started laughing this giggle. And it was like, he was being funny. But he, you know what I mean? There could be worse things. Like I might be all right with that compared to everything else that he might succumb to, the peer pressure, you know, all that stuff. I have hope for him, but it, but man, he didn't want to lose the crowd, right? Pilate didn't want to lose the crowd. There's a pressure going on. Uh, that was the first reason why he didn't want to do it. And I think the second reason why he, he, he did it was that he wanted to maintain something else. He wanted to maintain the control that he loved so much. The control that he had, man, he didn't want to get rid of that. And here's the thing, gang, I think about this. I think, imagine this man, how much out of whack is that? That he is willing to let an innocent man die rather than give over control that he has. Come on, that's crazy. But that's not so hard to get in our own lives, you know? Maybe it doesn't cause a death sentence for somebody else, but it's not so hard to see, come on, that we make decisions all the time that give us the power and control rather than allow God to have it in our own lives. Come on now, we do it all the time. We take control of things, through believing our way is better than God. Like, I know what you say, but I'm gonna do that. We take control over every time we go another way. We take control, uh, even though God says that's not the way and, and it's gonna mess you up, but we still say, nah, I think my way, well, I'm the exception. And we take control of that. We take control when, when we make decisions without praying to God first. Because we're like, well, I think we can figure this out. We, we'll pray here in a minute. We do that. We, we take control when we worry. When we worry, because worry is rooted out of fear and fear is not from the Lord. He does not give us a spirit of fear and it shows that, that, that we lack trust in God. So gang, listen to me. There would have been another pilot. He wasn't special. 
It's all of our controls that Jesus died for. He died for all of our control that we don't wanna give over. And there are more people, a lot more people who played a part in this. There are a lot more reasons that, that put him up there, a lot more words that we could put, but in all of them, in every single person, every single motive, every single nuance that we see in this story, the last person that put Jesus there, they were there, but not really maybe present, the last person and the last reason is me. It's you. It's us. And all, on all of this, we, we all have this. Pride in our lives, the control that we wanna maintain, the denial that, that we give, the greed that kinda sets us apart from what, what God wants us to have. And Jesus loved us so much that he said, I'm gonna die for it. I, he had you in mind. He knew who you were and, and he said, I'm gonna take the punishment for all of that. We're the last player in this, man. That we put him up there. It's your sin that put him on the cross. And gang, Jesus wanted to make it clear when he said, how will the scriptures be fulfilled any other way? He said, I'm in control. Don't you mess any of that up. I'm in complete control. Control. This was planned from the very beginning of time. It was supernatural, it was divine, and it was unstoppable. Every player, every motive, every moment, every blow, like leads straight to where we are. And in this moment, we see Jesus, God in the flesh, come right head to head with the sin of the world, with the love of God and the announcement that no one was in charge except for him. And gang, listen to me, man. For me, when I thought about this, you know what came up to me in that moment? The questions that we've been looking at. Who do you say I am? Do you believe I could do this? Do you wanna be healed? Where's condemnation gonna come from if I do this? Wow. And then it takes me back to the boat from the very first week of this series where it started, where we see Jesus kill this storm in front of these men and they look and what do they say? Who is this guy? He's not a guy. In front of them was Jesus, the Son of God, the Christ, the anointed one, the friend of sinners, the healer of people, the blesser of children, the Son of God who is about to be crucified on the cross. And he can stop it at any time, but he won't. He's not going to because he loves you that much. It's our sin that put him there, but gang, it's his choice to stay there. And this is where we're gonna leave this right now today. He's not on the cross yet. He's not dead yet. He's going to be crucified. And on Friday, on Good Friday, we're gonna continue this from this part. We're gonna take him from this moment all the way to him saying it's finished and him dying on the cross. So I hope you join us on Friday at seven o'clock. And then on Sunday, on Easter, we get the joy of the resurrection of him coming back and proving all the things that he said, but for now we're just left with Jesus about to be killed on a cross and the things that put him there and our part in this. Let's pray together. I'm just gonna ask you to just, I just want to give a moment to God, just you bow your heads and close your eyes just to maybe, I don't know, just give a moment of God with the words on this cross, wherever. I feel like God's speaking to you uniquely, so I'm just gonna give you a moment here. Jesus, we love you. Thank you for why you came. You came to give us life. You came to give us life everlasting. Help us to see the message you wanna to give to us. Help us see our part in this. And for believers in Christ in the room, man, I pray that we can be challenged in some areas right now, maybe just to encourage us in this message, challenge us a little bit with how we are processing this right now, God. I pray that you just... Bring us to a place of renewal and revival in the truth that we do know, 
and the salvation that we do have. And I pray that for some here, maybe you need to receive this for the first time and uh, accept the message of Jesus Christ and why he came and what he did for you and repent of your sin and surrender your life over to him. I'm just gonna quickly invite you to do that if that's something you've never done. I think that's why uh, you're here and that's what God is inviting you to do. You can just turn your life over, give him control, give up your pride, give up the greed in your life, give up the you in your life. It's not worth living for. I'm telling you right now, you're gonna find that out. But he said, I'm your solution, man. I'm gonna die for that so that you can have the life worth living. And so if you have never invited Jesus to be the savior of a life, you could just right now in this moment pray. Right now you can receive this. You can say, God, you made me. And with Jesus, you made a way for me. So I accept that I'm a sinner, that I have those things that are controlling my life. And I, I need those forgiven and I believe Jesus came to die for that sin. And so I, I give my life over to you. I place my faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of my sins and the penalty of that sin. And I, I accept your gift of grace, forgiveness, and mercy. And I commit my life to you forever. God, thank you for anyone who prayed that prayer. And I pray that, that you just, just fill them up with your life, fill them up with your Holy Spirit. It's awesome that somebody prayed that prayer right now. We love you. Uh, and as we focus on the Holy Week that we have coming up, we, we just pray that we can just continue to be in that moment of we'll put him on the cross until we see each other again on Friday. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Hey, gang, uh, hope to see you on Good Friday service. And if not, we'll see you on Easter Sunday where we celebrate the joy of the resurrection. Uh, for you families out there, we have a lot more of those Easter devotional things. So make sure you grab one, even for your neighbors or friends. Make sure we don't have any left. So take 20 if you want. See you next time. <laughs>